I'd like to start with the presentation of uh, Rabbi Yosef Kanevsky, uh, and please forgive me if, if I make a mistake, uh, and I have here two to correct me if I made a mistake. So we'll start. I was very excited about the presentation because it's as if Dr. Najatullah Sadiqi or Munzul Kahf or Mahmoud or I wrote the models, because it's very similar to the models that we have. And these are things which nobody has known about. And in the process of discovering about each other, I believe that the bonds will get uh, very strong. And he is a direct investor who invests on people's behalf in the Jewish tradition, which is not very much different than the Christian or the Islamic tradition. The money lending and interest in the Torah and the Jewish tradition is based on the two biblical, actually the main biblical source is Exodus 22. Exodus 22, of course, Exodus is the, the chapter which has to do with the Exodus of the people of the Jewish faith out of Egypt when Moses you know, touched the Red Sea with his stick and it split asunder and he crossed the Red Sea into the Sinai. And it, it's got three parts of that Exodus. 24, verse number 24, when you lend money to any of my people, now, to the poor among you, you shall not be to him or her as a creditor, nor shall you impose upon him or her any interest. Number 25, if you take your neighbor's night garment, as a pledge or a collateral, you shall return it to him or her by nightfall. Number 26, for that is his only covering. It is his or her garment for his or her skin. In what shall he or she sleep? And it shall come to pass that if he or she cries our unto me, I will hear it and I am compassionate. These are the three verses of the chapter on Exodus that the rabbi is referring to. The law is based on important word ami. Well, I think ami comes from amma, huh? <laughs> and my people, which is verse number 24. Now, my people, some people translate it as only the Jews. In other words, some people mistranslate this well. Well, the Jews believe that if you charge Money to a Jew, it is prohibited, but to a non-Jew, it is allowed. But actually, the translation of the word my people here, it is not the Jew. It means the poor people. And I want to say this to everybody so you can know. My, the poor people are the people of God because they are actually your trust from God into you if you are rich. God specifically regards those in need of loans as being his special people to whom he is very close. The lender should regard it as an honor to assist one of God's people and must conduct his or her affairs accordingly. And then the phrase, the phrase which says, you shall not be to him as a creditor, is interpreted to mean that the lender is prohibited from reminding the borrower of his dependent status in any way. Not much different. And I'm sure there are a large number of Muslims here, not much different from the Muslim tradition. Agree? I want you to tell me, those who believe in the Muslim faith. Amazing, right? And, and then we go next. Another proof that they all come from the same source, right? Now, the borrower is beloved of God, and the lender must bear this in mind. Even a facial, look at this, even a facial gesture on the lender's part can constitute a violation of this prohibition. And uh, that's why the Prophet ﷺ taught people that your smile in the face of your brother or sister in humanity is as if you have given a charity. See? So if you show a facial gesture, that actually is prohibited in the Jewish tradition. Now, <clears throat> The prohibition against the taking of interest is the most concrete expression of God's love for the debtor. The rabbinical inter interpretation is another source of the references used in the uh, Jewish law. The lender is prohibited from charging interest. Now, you can't have it clearer than that, right? This is very clear. The lender is prohibited from charging interest. And the borrower, not only the lender, the borrower is prohibited from offering to pay interest. <coughs> Now, in the Torah, 
It rejects the entire notion of the word loan. As a matter of fact, if you deal with American Finance House, Tariba, we never use the word loan. We use financing or co-financing as a transaction that brings benefit to the lender. Halakha, which is the rabbinical law, and I was taught yesterday that Halakha is like Sharia, the way. A person who either lends or voluntarily borrows on interest is disqualified from being a witness in the courts. How is that? This is very interesting. You cannot stand up as a witness in the Jewish courts if you lend with interest. <clears throat> now, expansion of the definition of interest. This is when things started getting into the new era. Now, interest can include considerations aside from cash. In other words, what people can go around the law and say uh, using uh, what we are learning from Enron and Anderson and all of this good stuff that are happening today. And they can say, well, yeah, I'm not charging interest, but, you know, I can live in your house at a discounted rent rate. Or, you know, I can, I'm not charging interest, but I can buy from you at a discount. That is also prohibited in the Jewish tradition. In Baba Mitzia, chapter 5, in Mishnah 2, gestures by which the creditor realizes benefit from the loan, he or she extended and are defined as interest by rabbinical definitions. Number one, it is prohibited to allow one's creditor to live in, utilize one's home or workplace rent free. It is even prohibited for the debtor to offer space to his creditor at a discounted rate. The permissibility of lending with interest to people who are not part of the Jewish community. And, and this is where it becomes very interesting. Talmud in Baba Mitzia 70b-71a and the post-Talmudic rabbis. Moses Maimonides, who is Ibn Maimun, in, the, in, in those of you who know the Islamic tradition. Moses Maimonides, Laws of Loans, he's got a big book called Laws of Loans. This was a philosopher who was an expert not only in finance but in medicine. And as a matter of fact, Maimonides is a very well-known character in the Islamic tradition. We'll talk about that later on. Laws of Loans, Chapter 5, Law Number 2. Number one, it is permissible for a Jew to charge interest of a non-Jew only, only when and in the amount necessary to provide himself with a basic living. Now, as you know, when the people of the Jewish faith lived in Europe, they were discriminated against. They could not find jobs in Europe because the Christian church was a little bit harsh on them. So they did not have a source of income, so their rabbis gave them the permission. It says it is permissible for a Jew to charge interest to a non-Jew only when, that's number one, and in the amount necessary to provide himself with a basic living. Number two, it is prohibited for a Jew to charge a usurious rate. In other words, the rate cannot be above a certain rate. Based on Rabbi uh, uh, Yosef uh, Kanevsky. The permissibility of lending with interest to people who are not part of the Jewish community. Again from the Talmud. The great rabbis of medieval France and Germany were somewhat more permissive under circumstances in which Jews were barred from most professions and Jewish communities were singled out for taxation above the ordinary rates. And the reference is included. The 16th century lifestyle became less agrarian and more commercial. Then there was a need for more commercial loans and less personal loans, which is prohibited by the Torah. There is something called the Heter Eska document, which is developed by rabbis in Poland and Eastern Europe. And this is where it becomes interesting. And, and this is where the concept of partnership or musharaka comes in as developed in Poland by the Hector Eska. This document attempted to transform the lender-borrower relationship into an investment relationship. The provider of capital or loan becomes a partner in the venture and the borrower will engage in. The provider will share a specified percentage of the realized profits with the borrower. Dr. Najatullah, isn't that very close to what, uh, what we do? Very amazing. It's an amazing thing. It's really amazing. Those of you who are in Islamic banking will be impressed to know that. 
This technical redefinition of the loan as an investment allowed Jewish commercial enterprises to succeed without the laws of interest being violated. Now, the Hector Aska refined, and it was refined several times to help ensure that the lender-investor relationship would not be exposing himself to an unacceptable level of risk. Some measure of return would be continually guaranteed, and Hector Eska is in common use to this day. As a matter of fact, if you go in and learn about the Jewish tradition in lending and ethics, you will find that it's being used until this day. There's another interesting thing, and that's interest-free loan societies. Many of you who do not know about the Jewish tradition, there are in every Jewish community a interest-free loan societies. In the Islamic tradition, we call it Qard Hassan, which is a good loan, because in Islam, a loan is only given without anything in, in, in reward, in back, even inflation adjustment. It's called Qard Hassan, or a loan in good faith. And the same thing applies in the Jewish communities, interest-free loan societies, available in all Jewish communities to preserve both the spirit and the letter of the laws of interest, often administered by local Jewish federations or other community-wide organizations. These societies are considered the true embodiment of the words of the Torah. In other words, they keep the Torah alive and they keep it in practice. And that ends the presentation of uh, Rabbi Joseph Kanavsky, and I hope you enjoyed it. <coughs> right. <laughs>